All right, guys, this is uh, Phil and Sandy. As you know, they're kind of our missions directors, not even kind of, they really are our missions directors. And they got it from here. Hi, I'm Sandy. Um, I just want to do a really quick overview of some of the people that aren't here. And um, they're wonderful people. There's a a missionary from the 1800s that said, his name was David Livingston, and he said, if a commission by a earthly king is considered an honor, then an earth, a commission by a heavenly king should be, shouldn't be considered a sacrifice. And we have so many people that are out and that are doing things, and sometimes we think, oh, they're sacrificing family, they're sacrificing money, they're doing all these things. But if you talk to them, they're going to talk about the great honor it was to serve their heavenly king. And this is what the, the people are who aren't here I want to share. Um, there's two lovers of Jesus, Josh and Jackie, who are in the Middle East. Um, totally keep them in your prayers. They are doing wonderful things for the kingdom of God. Um, Jackie came this summer and shared with our mission group. And, um, oh, I forgot commercial. I have this in my hand because this is the newsletter. <laughs> um, read it. It has all the info in it. Anyway, commercial over. Um, Jack, Josh and Jackie are just doing wonderful things for the kingdom of God in the Middle East, and they are using such creative ways of expressing Jesus and showing the love of God to others. Um, it was really amazing to hear the, her story of what they're doing, and because of their... Um, their jobs, they are teachers, they're able to get access to a lot of people that even some of the missionaries that have been in the Middle East several years have never had access to. They're, go, they're able to go into the homes, able to, to really share Jesus. And for those of you that know Josh and Jackie, you know they just totally radiate Jesus. I mean, wherever they go, you, you just see the love of Jesus. And so for them, they're just breaking down walls just by who they are and the king and the God they serve. And then there's Kayla Tomberlin. She's been part of our mission group since 2009. And Kayla is, she's another crazy person that just lights up a room and you just see Jesus in her. I just, I love this about all of our missionaries. You just see Jesus in their lives. You don't even have to say a word. You just know there's something different about that person. She's, so, she's different than the world. And Kayla, when she, she's been in, um, suffering in Hawaii. <laughs> but she works with Youth with a Mission, with YWAM. And this past summer, she got to go to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the love of her heart. She's been there several times. And um, in Ethiopia, she worked with a group, a people group called the Oromo people. And um, she worked with missionaries. She worked with street kids. And she also got to surprise some of the children that she worked with who are now young adults. Um, she got to surprise them, and she sent me a little video, and one of the girls was screaming, probably literally for about three minutes, going, ah! when Kayla walked in because it was such a surprise. So these are the things that are an honor, the relationships that we build, and, and just such fun uh, the, the covenant that we have with people. And Kayla was just so thrilled to be able to go back. And she's doing really well. And the, on a personal note, what's going on with Josh and Jackie is that they're expecting. And with Kayla, she's engaged. So life goes on. You can be ministering, serving Jesus, and life is still going on. So that's a great thing. And then I want to mention Brenda Ziak and her husband, Joe, because Joe's still doing a wonderful work in with Ethnos Asia and A in all of Asia, and he's right now, he, today he's in Armenia, and they have been also asked to teach over Skype, because people are hungry for the word, people are hungry, and um, so they're doing it through Skype sometimes, and even Brenda got to teach, was it Russia, Brenda? She got to teach people in Russia through Skype, so God is using amazing ways for um, others to um, to just reach out. And I don't want to forget the, the, the other groups that we're working with. Um, it's Arms of Love. We still sponsor two children, one, um, uh, one boy from Nicaragua, not Nicaragua, who we've sponsored almost his entire life. He's almost 14, so he, that's a long time. <laughs> and then we sponsor, the women's group sponsors the little girl from um, the Philippines. And we also have, work with Connect Africa, with Timothy Two Group, which is a group Phil and I are part of, and just a lot of other groups. And so I'm going to hand this over to Phil so you can hear more of what God is doing with the people in this body. It's just really exciting.
Thank you. This gives me great pleasure to share with my family. Uh, let's put this all before the Lord right now. I'll ask Amy to start coming up, Amy Strom. And uh, Father, we don't do this for any glory of our own. We don't do this because it's easy. There's no fame or anything like that that we get out of it. It's just for the body of Christ. Last week we heard so many stories about how you're growing the church. And we heard about vineyards being in a thousand places, a thousand churches. But you, you have collected a body all over the world. There's no place that isn't reached. And you are drawing people to yourself in dreams and visions, in places where people, where ministers, servants of yours can't go. It's exciting to watch, exciting to be a part of. And Father, I, we take this time right now to let this church, our body here, see some of the work that we're doing in your name. And we thank you for it. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless it, that, it, uh, that you'll be glorified and honored in our efforts. We commit them all to you. We thank you, Lord. And we ask you to bless our time together here now in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, Amy. Turn this on for you. See, check it. It's good. Hello. At the beginning of this year, Amy uh, came up with a project to help uh, one of the places she loves, Uganda. Is that true? Yes. Now, how did you want to help them? Um, so what happened was, uh, like five or six years ago, I went to Uganda with the team here uh, from church and um, worked with Connect Africa. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of that um, trip, I learned about, you know, the technologies that um, Trevor and Jana produce for people, for, you know, people all over the country there. Um, that are very inexpensive and they actually build the things themselves and so it helps the economy as well as like provide water and very basic necessities. Now they train the people that they build these things for, don't they? Yes, it's not like, um, you know, Americans come or people come and do all the work. It's like they give them the, you know, the um, tools by training them and help them to learn how um, to say, for example, collect rainwater, which is, you know, they're in desperate need for clean drinking water. Children are still dying of, you know, malnourishment, but also, you know, um, because there's, their water source is really horrible there. You know, Uganda has become like a focus for the river. Um, uh, Lisa and Teresa, got involved with Connect Africa several years ago and saw that as their way of reaching or, or doing their part for missions. And we've continued that because it's such valuable work. Uganda, as many of you already know, was run by an evil dictator named Idi Amin. He decimated the country. He destroyed a lot of their infrastructure, killed Anybody who might rise up against them, professors, doctors, teachers, um, and anybody who is of a, a different tribe than them, gone. So that country was kind of left to the devil. I mean, there was nothing there for them. The people who lived there were in great, great need. And uh, God began to answer by calling uh, his servants there in all sorts of various ways. Jana and Trevor, their story, if you haven't heard it, you can talk to Teresa, she represents them here. I'm gonna call her up as soon as we're through with Amy. Um, to begin giving those people hope. Without hope, it's a really dark life. And I'm, I know that you minister here to people who are losing hope, who are in the middle of uh, despairing, 
and you do everything you can to turn them to Christ. He is our hope. Uh, this is what Amy got a vision for, to help. How did you come in contact with this village? Okay, so I'm a very practical person, and the Lord knows that. So um, just I'm doing my business. I have several clients, and um, one particular client mentioned to me that he had this philanthropic, you know, heart. And, um, you know, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then he told me a little bit about where he had um, built a well, a, a water well. Um, and that happened to be in Uganda. So I'm like, wow, Lord, like, Small it would be world. so cool to, you know, talk to him more about that. But he's my client, so I don't feel... Um, like Open. it's my position, yeah, to be like, hey, do you want to like connect with, you know, my thing or whatever. So anyway, I just prayed that the Lord would open the door for an opportunity there. And, um, and I prayed a lot about it because I knew that, that what Trevor and John are doing with Connect Africa is um, very tangible and it's very inexpensive and it's very like uh, life-giving. And, I mean, we're talking about something just like water, you know. How much money did you have to raise? So the goal was $3,500, which is, was for um, a rainwater harvesting tank, which Uganda gets five feet worth of water dropping from the heavens, and they're still dying of diseased water. Right. So... Um, $3,500, and where did you raise it? $3,500. So what I did was I just created like a Facebook campaign and um, just asked friends and family, and also we presented it here to the church. I did like little bulletin inserts and stuff, but um, I feel like, you know, it was amazing the way God connected the people because, like I said, it was my client who, you know, is in the business world. Um, obviously, I'm in the market, you know, marketplace, whatever, and... Um, at the point where I felt like the Lord had said, now's the time, I just basically asked him to have a phone, a conference call with him and his wife, um, and shared that I would love to pre present to them, you know, the opportunity to provide a rainwater harvest at their location where they built the well. Because Trevor shared and taught us when we were in Uganda that um, these water wells like break and they don't have the resources to fix them. So it's great for somebody to come in and build a, um, you know, a water pump or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's what Americans do, right? But, mm -hmm. but then there's no, you know, responsibility for it. It's like... Nobody have, there to maintain they it. They don't have the tools. Yeah. So anyway, a tank is like literally like a giant, you know, holding device and the rain comes from the sky. So it's pretty darn simple. Um, you know, and, and the maintenance is, is minimal if at any, I think they clean it out like once so every So she five raised years. the money here through various sources. Uh, some of you participated. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much, uh, to help not only these people, but, uh, Amy accomplished the goal that God gave her. So now Trevor comes in and he's on his way to go set this thing up to train the people and, and build the device and show them how to maintain it. Yes. Now, I heard an interesting story from Trevor last week. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me what it was or do you know Well, it? he tells it better because he has like a Canadian accent, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, the big deal with this particular location is that the gentleman that lives in there, lives in the um, place, it, the, the Ugandan, chief. yeah, he's like a really um, well-known, like upper echelon, you know, type guy. They're powerful. And what she's trying to say is if these guys don't go for it, it ain't going to happen. Exactly. It's like a big, big deal to get in his good gracia, graces. Um, so, yeah, so... Uh, Trevor even heard of the guy, and the guy is the one that my client, you know, is feeding money to for, like, this water pump that they did or whatever. So anyway, um, I tell Trevor the name of the guy, and he's like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. You know, it'll be difficult, but I can, you know, do the thing, the customary things and do the traditional, you know, present him with whatever this gift and do this. We need this to move and, it along. Sorry. Oh. Um, so, yeah, then Trevor was on safari one day. 
and um, there was a bus that was broken down. And so he saw the people and they had plenty of room in his bus and so he stopped and started you know, loading their things onto his bus um, just to help them out. And it so happened that it was the very assistant to this head honcho Powerful guy. Powerful man. Um, so anyway, she was very grateful, of course, and connected him right away with our, you know, main guy. And um, as soon as Trevor introduced himself and told him, he recognized Trevor's name and said, oh, you're the guy that really, you know, saved the day on safari with my assistant. And he said, oh, I guess I'm that guy. You know, a lot of the things that we do just out of love, you know, to help people, are what God uses to open doors. You know, sometimes it's an opportunity for us to share the gospel. Sometimes it's an opportunity for us to come alongside them and fulfill a need that they have, an answer to prayer, if you will. And that's what happened here with Trevor. You know, he's just going about his day, sees a woman in need, helps her out. Turns out that she is an assistant to this very powerful man. And once he recognized the heart of Trevor, it was an open door. And they were able to do all their work and with this man's approval and uh, really get things in motion. Um, it, it's amazing to me that it's, we say it's a small world, but it's God's small world. And we're just moving around, doing our little bit, and God behind the scenes is opening doors, closing doors, uh, but making things happen that he wants to have happen. Amy was one part. She saw a need. She asked God what she could do. God had her meet a client, no less, and things happened. This is, this is the way God does things, and it's a blessing to see. Can I share one thing? One small tiny thing. He wants thing. to share. Should we let her share teeny, one more tiny thing? thing. Yeah. Okay, so the thing about this, um, this man, this like high-powered man, he's no, well-known in the whole country. He has several you know, schools and locations, and he actually runs a vocational school. And so with this connection with Trevor, he's now talking, like we were just talking last week when Trevor was here, that he's talking with him about training up a giant, a bi even bigger circle of the community there with these kind of, you know, simple technologies. So, you know, it's, it's anyway, the ripple effect, it's kind of cool. Teresa, would you come up, please? We're gonna find out a little bit more about what Connect Africa does. Thank you, Amy. This is you guys at work. Hi. Hi. Am I just doing an update? Yeah, for you're you? doing an update. You're kind of letting, because some people don't understand what Trevor and Jana do with Connect Africa. Maybe you can explain mm -hmm. it a little bit as you go. Okay. Um, well, as um, we, Amy's already said, we've had um, Trevor and Jana in our midst for the last couple of weeks or so, and everybody whoever was able to talk with them. And, and um, anyway, he just left yesterday. Yeah. Um, back to Uganda, there is another center that's opening up in Kenya, where it's called their Resource Center, uh, where they'll start teaching the technologies there. There's a couple other centers also um, there, but um, what they do is um, with the, yeah, the water filters, the water, huge water tanks, which I was thinking I should be doing that at our house, <laughs> when it does rain. And um, permaculture, they're teaching people how they can, um, especially in Kenya, they had dry land and now it's growing crops. Uh, even fish ponds, they're, so they're going into all different areas to where the, the people are being self-sustained. And um, that's what their love is. Um, it has changed from when they first went there, I think 18 years ago or so, where just like what's happened with Amy, they're now like working with individuals more, um, churches more, organizations more that want to go in themselves and begin to um, be, you know, be blessing the people themselves. So that just seems to be a little shift right now in what Trevor and Donna, Jonna are doing. Um, I did then want to say they've been on the road since I think April. They bought an RV right. and um, went around um, pretty much all of the United States. Um, 
stopping at churches that have partnered with them. Um, they did end one partnership, but sharing about what's happening in Uganda, sharing about um, their need for a dorm. So they were collecting money um, because there's so much response in Uganda from the other countries that they want to come in, pastors, workers, they want to take this technology back to their communities, but they need to come and learn. And so there's no space, though the hub is large, the area, they don't have dorms to put them in. So they are all living in like tents. So the dorm is almost done. Great. And now they are raising money as the, the financial board member of the organization. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're raising um, about $15,000 to build a real kitchen. It's not the stoves on the ground like they normally do. And, the, you know, the ladies are down here stoves. doing this. The rocket stoves. They're actually going to have stoves and working burners and, I guess, a refrigerator. They do now have electricity. It's taken many, wow. many years to get electricity. That's been very difficult on Jana raising two boys without a refrigerator. And, uh, and then um, an area, a patio area to feed the people. But they'll go 150 people up to 300. And these women, I don't know how they do it, but they feed the people that come. But that just seems to be the big thrust that to get more people to learn the technology and then to go back. So um, that's, that's great. Kind of In years update. past, we uh, would send a team every year. Don would uh, normally be the fall guy to lead it. And uh, everybody was invited to participate. You pretty much had to raise your own funds, but Sandy and I can vouch for God. And if he wants to send you, you'll, you'll have what you need to go. And uh, I, I would love to see that start up again. Thank you, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Just leave the... Uh, okay. We'll be talking more about team building, team raising, um, maybe at the end of this thing, but that's going to be one of the pushes I'd love to see happen as we see more and more young people come in. Hey, young people is where it's at. You know, when you get like me, you can't do the things you used to do. So um, speaking about young people, Jenny and Julia. You know, when Trevor and, and uh, Jenna went to Uganda, she was barren. She was unable to have children. And uh, they were, of course, concerned about that. They began working there, and what do you know? She, she got pregnant. Now they have two kids. God's into fixing our problems as well as helping us fix his. So that's a, that's a big deal. Now... These are the Bedell girls, Jill and Dave. Um, how old are you? I'm 17. And? I'm 14. These two girls had an opportunity to go to? Romania. Romania. How did that come about? Well, I've always had a passion for missions. Even like when I was uh, 15, I believe, I got this like passion on my heart, just I need to go. Um, and so the principal at our school, her daughter came one time to kind of share about her mission, um, her kind of her ministry in Romania. And she just shared all these stories and suddenly my heart started pounding and I was like, I have to go. Um, and so afterwards I went up and I talked to um, she and her husband and just say, would there ever be an opportunity and it kind of seemed like a, like a slim at first, but we ended up talking with the um, principal and we set up this entire group. It was, it was very small. It was me, um, Julia, and then two of the girls and the principal and her husband. Um, and we just ended up, yeah, setting this up and going. So, and your parents were involved in all this back then? For the most part, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say probably not that much. <laughs> not really. Yeah, No. okay, because when we met you at our uh, Paul and Barnabas meeting, Dave and, I think J Dave and Jill brought them for us to kind of talk them out of it, <laughs> if I'm to be honest. <laughs> My dad but, was worried. But hearing what God had put on, on Julia, uh, Jenny's heart, how can you say no to something like that? Can you remember um, a guy named Samuel in the Bible? How old was he when he was sleeping 
in the temple and God spoke to him. He was young. He hadn't done anything yet. And yet God called to him when Eli was just a couple of rooms over. God loves to use young people. They have the vision. They have the strength. They have the opportunity. Um, and you guys got to go. How was Romania? It was amazing, honestly. It was definitely something different than I had like expected. Um, when we first got there, it just seemed all the kids were very shut off and very cold. Because um, in the orphanage that they live in, it's not that their parents have died. It's they're either abandoned or unwanted. Um, so all their parents are living and they still know where their parents are. And they're actually forced to go like see their family once a month in order, or no, once a year, in order for their families to receive money for the child that the child will probably never see. Um, and so the, it, you just see like these walls that are up. And it just, it was interesting going into the orphanage and kind of like starting off um, we had Bible studies, and they just seemed really shut off. Um, we even had like a, we started a VBS, and none of the kids seemed interested. Um, they were so, we did skits as well, and they first like looked at them and were just so confused at what we were doing. Um, but, yeah. There was kind a of, breakthrough that took place yeah. during all this. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about that? Yeah. Um, so one way that we actually went like that, the kids kind of got intrigued and we brought them in was through music. Um, every day we would have worship and my friend Maya um, would just constantly be playing guitar and they were so amazed at the guitar and just like the words and they ended up, um, Good Good Father was kind of like our theme song for the entire, um, the entire two weeks. And so one night, um, there was kind of like a, an, an attack almost. Um, on, which is just with the group. And so we ended up praying f until like two in the morning that night, um, just wow. constantly just in full prayer. And then the next day we just saw this change. Like suddenly they were interested. They were, um, you could just see like their eyes lighting up on, for everything that we said. Um, the messages like s they were talking about during lunch. And you could just see like a full change in all of them. Prayer yeah, led yeah. to the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. A spiritual breakthrough. Yeah. We sing songs about God breaking the chains, but prayer is God's vehicle for doing that. And these kids opened up to you. At what point had you been there? Three days, two days, a week? We'd been there about like three days. Oh, so you had a lot of time after that. Yeah. To really love on the kids and to have them love on you. Mm -hmm. Did you see any uh, difference in the kids? Um, yeah, so um, when we got there, of course, we, were, we, were, we knew that we were only planting seeds. <clears throat> Sorry. Planting seeds. Planting seeds, yeah. And so, um, you know, and we, we, um, we told that, you know, we, didn't, we wouldn't be surprised if they weren't going to open up too, um, too quickly. But um, as we began, you know, bonding with them and, you know, like playing soccer with them and just kind of like living life with them, they really um, began to open up in those walls. We could start to see they were coming down and they really began to... Um, be vulnerable with us and we could really um could really see that like yearning inside of them to be known and stuff like that and especially with the girls with me with the girls and jenny has them too but yeah it was it was crazy because they really began to really kind of yearn for us yearn for our you know love that you know well these kids them. had experience being kind of rejected by their own parents but then they hear about this god who loves them and even sent two young girls to go be with them, to love them. And that sets people free. Love sets people free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys spent two weeks there. Mm -hmm. How do your folks feel about you going now? Oh, they want to come. <laughs> They're excited. <laughs> yeah. We're actually planning on going again next year. Oh, great. But, yeah. That is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, this is our children going. Can we all go? No, that's not our purpose for all of us to go. That's not the way the church was designed and built. But God calls people and he tells the rest of the church, set aside Paul and Barnabas or Julie and Jenny for the work I've called them into. We help them go. We support projects like giving water to people who are desperate need for it. We supply funds so that they can, that two young girls can go and reach 
I don't know. How many kids were there? Um, about 20. About 25. Yeah. 25 kids that their lives will change. And as they continue to go back, these kids, they got no place else to go. So guess what's going to happen when they go back? We're talking party. <laughs> and I know you're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to the opportunity of helping you go. Is it okay if I share one more story? Share one more story, sure. Okay. Um, one of the biggest impacts that we saw, actually, if you look in the picture over there, um, the little boy that's writing, I love you, Father, with rocks. Um, he had been the newest addition to the orphanage. And his father had constantly said, oh, I'm going to come see you. I'm going to pick you up. Um, one day when his father didn't come, he actually basically tried to light the orphanage on fire. And he was just hurting and crying. We would find him under the slide, just bawling his eyes out. And so one day we started singing Good Good Father and we just kept kind of like reinstating how um, Jesus is our loving heavenly father. And then throughout that, that rest of the week, he was singing that and he started writing these messages, just I love you, Father, I love you, Father. And you could just see this like child who had been so hurting and crying just suddenly light up and feel welcomed and loved. And, yeah. No wonder you want to go back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I'm gonna call Caitlin Scudder up next. You know, we may not feel like we do much for missions, but you really do a lot more than you understand. That's why we like to do this at least once a year to let you know how much uh, your contributions, how much your support means to these people that not only the ones that are going, but the ones who are on the receiving end, even in places like Uganda, Caitlin Scudder. Caitlin has been with us for quite a few years now. We've seen her go up and down the coasts of South and Central America. We've seen her go to Uganda a couple of times, several times. And we've even been part of the work she's doing there. In what way have we been a part of it? I see is, is that a, oh, that's not the school, that's just your kids. Yeah, those are the kids of the main pastor that I work with in Uganda. His name is Robert and he has eight children and, um, <laughs> He's amazing. So he runs an organization called Mercy Seat, and this church has partnered with what he's doing there in different ways. Um, but basically, he's focused on uh, community development programs that, that kind of hit the whole community. So there's a school. We're working on building a borehole and larger projects like that. Um, and then just individual programs where we're working with families. So there's a lot with uh, family empowerment. There's a lot of elderly widows in our village who are raising orphan kids and taking them in. Um, and they're really struggling to be able to feed those kids. So um, we've, we've identified some of the most vulnerable families and we've done some microloan projects and some animal rearing projects and um, the women's ministry here raised some money for, for some of the women in Uganda. So we're able to distribute that to specific families, um, especially just some of the women who had really stored stewarded money really well. Um, we gave them extra to help their businesses and some people are helping out with this school, which I guess I'll talk about in a little bit. But. Um, Mercy Seat is on the internet. You can just uh, go and visit it. You'll see Pastor Robert. You'll see some of the people that he works with. And then you'll see the international team, which is Caitlin and some of her friends that also work beside her. Um, it's hard to believe how great the need is, you know, because we're Americans. I mean, we don't see that kind of need, at least not in Orange County. But by finding people that are willing to go or aren't involved, we become a part of that too. Uh, when you get to heaven, I think you're going to be really surprised with the people who come up to you and say thank you. You aren't going to recognize them, but because uh, all things are known then, they'll recognize you. And what a glorious time that's going to be. When we think about heaven being a party, we have no idea. You guys are part of our family. You're part of uh, what we support. And Caitlin is definitely a big part of that. Um, 
Tell me more about this school. So um, when I was living in Uganda, I met with some of the local leaders and they had said that they really, really wanted a nursery school in our village um, because there wasn't one, didn't exist. Um, they were really interested in an English speaking primary school as well. So in Uganda, English is the unifying language. Um, but a lot of kids in the villages are taught only in their mother tongue, so they can't communicate with people from other tribes, they can't pass national exams, they can't get into high school or university if they don't know English. So um, they wanted an English-speaking school. So um, when I came back last year, I moved back from Uganda about a year ago, and I did a fundraiser for this school. Had no idea if I'd be able to raise enough money or not. Um, and quickly money came in, um, the Ugandans on the ground, built a school in a couple of months and had it up and wow. running a few months later. Um, and so right now we have two nursery classes, three primary school classes, and then what we call a foundational class. So that's for older kids who have never gone to school, but they, um, so they really should be like in the lowest nursery class, but we don't want to embarrass older kids. So we have them in their own special class where they're kind of learning the basics. And then the school will grow every year uh, with the kids. So next year we'll add primary five and When you going. first started this, your vision was for how many kids? Um, well, I was hoping to start with just nursery school. That was a plan. We were going to have just 25 kids in each class. So it's supposed to be 75. And then when I went back to Uganda, yeah, these are the kids now. When I went to visit Isn't Uganda that neat? Look at the school May, you guys helped build. Yeah, they picked up a few others. <laughs> so um, they added a few other classes, but... Yeah, it's, it's running a little differently than we had originally thought. <laughs> Always but, does. But it's going really well, and the people in the village are so excited, and, um, and people here have, have helped out a lot with that. So thank you to everyone who's, who's contributed. Um, the school is actually run on teacher sponsorships. So a lot of organizations, you, you sponsor a child. But we really wanted to stay away from handouts. Um, so the main cost of running a school is paying the teacher salaries. So what we decided to do is get sponsors for the teachers to cover the main cost of running the school. And then the students still have to pay some small tuition to pay for chalk and notebooks and stuff like that. So they're still part of what's happening, but the main costs are taking. I had of. never heard of that before. Was that something that you guys came up with or my friend Ashley who used to live there with me she thought of the idea she's a teacher in the states actually That's and we a brainstormed idea. a lot yeah so it's working well so we have some of our teacher sponsors here helping us out and it's running really well yeah now anybody who has ever worked with people in great need is aware of one harsh truth um, you get betrayed you get taken advantage of. Uh, things that you had planned to move forward with get stolen or, or taken off in a different direction. Has that happened with you? Just a few times, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, when I, I, I mean, I've been back and forth, but total I lived in Uganda about three years. I've been robbed three or four times, I've been arrested. <laughs> um, or jaywalking. Yeah, they make up rules and they arrest you if you're white sometimes. Um, so all kinds of stuff happens. Um, and then some people who I really trusted, who I was working with in ministry, um, I found out about some stuff that had been going on behind the scenes after I left. And one of the men who had been kind of like a father to me had, had been stealing and um, so I really it isn't even so much that they're stealing. It's just they have funds that's targeted for someplace else, but their car breaks down or they need tires, you know, and rather than use the money as it's directed, they redirect it to make it possible for them to continue doing what they need to do. And it's just a harsh reality. I, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us. We're Caitlin's family. When she comes in, all these emotions, all these betrayals, disappointments are on her. But with all of us standing around them, praying for them, encouraging them, do you plan on going back, Caitlin? Definitely, yeah. Uganda's my heart, even though it's 
definitely been challenging. And I think when you know people who are in such great need and you just see the desperation in them, um, you can understand why some of that temptation to steal and betray comes in. And um, Robert, the main guy I work with, he's really proven to have integrity throughout. I've known him for 10 years. Um, he's non never done anything to make me question him. So I feel like it's not fair to stop partnering with a righteous man because other people have done things against me that aren't righteous. And um, like right now there's a drought going on that's really bad and people are starving. And so I feel like it doesn't matter if they've stolen or lied or cheated. Like no one deserves to starve to death. Right. It doesn't matter what you do. So um, you just... I guess I've just learned you do what you feel like God is telling you to do, and that's what you're responsible for. You're not responsible for how people react to it. If you can find one righteous man to work with, yeah. everything else becomes possible. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's important for us to read our Gospels, to read our Bibles, to try and please God, to be that righteous man here. Because whether you know it or not, the people in your workplace, people in your family, they recognize a righteous person. And uh, your opportunities come from that. We're all missionaries. And uh, a few of us have the opportunity of going other places. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna ask uh, Ed West. Hey. Okay, um, I had the privilege of working, well, over, the time, over this time with Phil and Sandy and, and being able to, to go with you and Timothy too to Ensenada, Mexico. And so I was asked to share just a little bit of what it was like in, in two ways. One is um, working with the people. To me, that's the most, one of the most exciting things is to be able to be with people, people from other cultures and other situations. And um, I mean, even Paul said, uh, I, w I have something to give to you, but what I'm hoping for, this is my translation, and, and, but what I'm hoping for is that I receive from you too. It's Romans 1.11. That's right. So I'm looking to give, but I'm also looking to receive. And many times when you go, you receive more than you could ever possibly give out. That's absolutely true. And, and it's very exciting. And the other, the other aspect of all that is that God is interested in you being able to make yourself available. And, and things change. You come thinking you're going to do X, and then, <laughs> and then you're given uh, W and T and Z and A and B. And that's what we did. And what you thought you were going to do this great and wonderful thing, you end up working with the kids and you get to, and thank the Lord there wasn't any puppets, but you get to do amazing things. <laughs> And, and it's, it's, it's just wonderful. And you get, go through the wars with people and you see God do amazing things. It's a privilege to be able to go and to serve. Thank you, Ed. Team building is great. You know, being part of a team is wonderful. Ed and, and Caitlin went with us to Mexico. We had no idea what the requirements were going to be but they exceeded all my wishes, that's for sure. I know we're strapped for time. I got a lot to say, though. So <laughs> what, how do we respond to that? Tough. <laughs> Tough toenails, you know? You, uh, you had planned a trip to go to Ethiopia, and yeah. you had to cancel it because of what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. But that hasn't dimmed your vision. No, you know, um, we're getting ready to go on our sixth trip, and there's some civil unrest there, so pray, please pray. I can't go into details, but uh, it's serious. Uh, but we are, we've been doing women's conferences. We had close to 500 women there last year. I was, I'm invited to preach in the churches, which is huge for a woman to preach in church in Ethiopia. They, they don't care for women ministers at all. <laughs> But, um, but God is really doing some breakthrough stuff. And so we know the enemy's on the move, but God is greater. Uh, we've been asked the last few years to do men's conferences. The men in Ethiopia have been asking us women to do a conference uh, for them. That is huge. 
because we go after the heart. And so Julie just heard, my partner in ministry just heard that the church has given complete approval to do a men's conference, women's conference, and youth conference. Uh, so we hope to go in February or March. Uh, we're seeing a breakthrough. We're seeing a major breakthrough. Hallelujah. So it's really exciting. Julie works with Pink Girls. Some of you are familiar with that. It's a girls tutoring education program. Uh, they had 48 girls that were, had to pass an exam, and usually only 20% will pass an exam to go on to university. All 48% pass the exam. 100%. Which means that they get full tuition and boarding care and transportation to go to school. For girls. So these girls um, have dreams and visions of being lawyers and doctors and scientists and um, Olympians. Uh, they, they have dreams and vision, and, and the, what's interesting is Mark Fields last, year, last week kept bringing up Ethiopia, and, and God is on the move in Ethiopia. The enemy's, you know, kicking and screaming like a toddler, but he's defeated. God is really doing an incredible work, and so if you're interested in going with us, it's exciting, it's challenging, it's hard, it's painful, but it is incredible. So thank you for all your support, the women's ministry. They supported the work we did. Um, and helping me pay for my airline ticket. So uh -huh. that's very exciting. I love Ethiopia, it's an incredible place. Africa gets in you and it never gets out. We were so impressed with the work that Julie, her friend Julie is doing over there with Pink Girls, that it was a pretty easy sell for us to convince uh, Don to allow us to help support them. We don't, we don't have a lot of funds, but we wanna make sure that everything that we give in the mission field not only represents you to God, but represents God's heart in the field. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Amen. Uh Thanks. we are in your debt. Uh Don, I think I'm gonna ask you up to yep. to close. Thank you, thank you, you Patty. Right? You did <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. We are up against it. Isn't it great? How many people here have been on missions in this uh, awesome? Look at this, look at this. That's crazy. This is my church. This is amazing. This is one of the things I do love about us as a church is that we, we value missions. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us a heart to go. And Lord, I thank you for the people that have said yes to that. Whether they themselves go or they help others go, Lord, all of us as a family are involved. And we thank you that you've called us. And we thank you that there have been those who have answered the call. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing. Now bless us now as we go. Amen.